I would like to introduce Colin Offlin, who is a friend and a CTO of New AE. New AE is an embedded security and consulting company based out of Canada. Colin will hi uh, highlight major hardware attacks and share his thoughts on future of hardware security and increasing accessibility throughout the industry. He's the inventor of Chip Whisperer, a complete open source tool chain for side channel, power analysis, and glitching attacks. For those who want to get to know, also get into also hardware hacking, please do check out the book that Colin and Jasper have just published, The Hardware Hacking Handbook. It's available on No Starch Press for pre-order today. Colin, we have a request uh, to also have Luna, if she can, uh, join the talk. And now over to you. All right. Thanks very much, uh, Antrish, for that introduction and for having me at Hardware.io. Um, this is a, a great event. I, I, you know, I say not just because you know technical um, people there, but the the people I know when it's in person, right? It's more a reunion than it is a chance to um, uh, a chance to sort of just uh, get the technical content. So that's the one thing I think we all miss um, with not doing it in person. But um, to give a bit of a different feel, I thought you know what would be fun. And like most ideas, it, it sounds fun until you start to execute it, of course, um, is to not use slides. So you'll, you might have to make my video big for this to be legible. Um, hopefully the Zoom compression isn't killing you here. Um, but yeah, we're going to do it live. So I have a whiteboard. Um, we have some stuff that we'll look at. And we're going to do the talk like this. Um, Luna is somewhere around here sleeping. So I'll, I'll bring her in towards the end um, once they're interested or when, once they're awake a little bit, I think, you know, they don't care as much about hardware, but they really like, uh, snacks. Um, so this, this talk is about, you know, here's the title slide, um, about what I see as the cheapskate re revolution, I call it, but I also want to emphasize a lot about accessible hardware. Um, so what I'm going to kind of go through quickly is I first want to look at some different threat models, um, and in particular, some different attacks that I think are really interesting. And, some of these attacks our um, friends and colleagues have done, are, are working on right now, um, but a lot of them have been done with very low cost equipment. So if we had this discussion 10 years ago, what people would think is a reasonable hardware attack is gonna look a lot different than having it today. So I think that's a pretty interesting place to start. Um, I then wanna look at accessible hardware security. So this is where we're bringing down the cost, but the important thing is not just the cost. I, I, you know, Sometimes we can get really, um, it costs $10 to do the attack, that's great. Um, but also about what else is around it to sort of help push the industry forward. And I also wanna highlight a few of the projects that uh, I know of, and there, there's even more now. So it's kind of a call to you know, bring these projects to the forefront um, that are working in the same area. Um, I, and to sort of you know, talk about my project in particular, I thought it might be interesting to say, well, you know, how did we get here? How did I get Chip Whisper to, to do what it is? And a little bit of a chance to talk about some of the history um, and future of it. The other thing I wanted to look at is, you know, this is more offensive security, you could say, because we're looking at breaking embedded systems. We're looking at that. Um, but what's the flip side of it? Because actually a lot of the projects have been about um, the low cost offensive tooling is what we're seeing. What, projects are, what, you know, the interesting research is. Um, and the defensive side has been more done in industry, right? It's, it's not very accessible. That's kind of a problem, I think. Um, but that's changing. There's actually been some projects previously that have looked at it. There's some new projects that are really getting quite popular. Um, so to me, it also is a really good time, you know, to look at this. Because when I kind of started Chip Whisper, it was pretty early on in um, accessible side channel, I'd call it. Um, and to me, I see this as the early stages of accessible hardware security um, that is going to eventually lead to real chips, right, that could be open source, that are things you could actually look at the designs of. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the plan. So um, the first part here on threat models, the, the question I want to bring up is if you look at like a new device that's just been released, um, how come someone is able to actually pretty quickly take that device and recover secret information from it. So I had a few examples I wanted to look at. Um, one was the uh, AirTag. So I don't know if uh, Thomas Roth, St Stack Smashing or Leonard um, are watching, but they had gotten pretty early um, sort of information on these two. Um, so these are a little, you know, cheap Apple product, um, cheap, not in a, in a bad way, but just in a low cost way. Um, and it's, it's interesting because it was just released, right? So this is a, a cool thing because it's like a, a recently released device. 
So if we look at what's inside one of them, um, let's see. So I have a few that I've kind of already instrumented here. Um, and it's a little hard to see, so I'm going to move it to a, uh, another camera that is over here. There we go. So this is going to be a little more extreme. I don't have a good in-between, I'm sorry. So it's either too, too close right now or too far. So give me a second. Right. So these are ones that have been a bit instrumented. Um, so on the back side, you just have a bunch of test points and stuff like that, right? So nothing too interesting. Um, where it's, it's more kind of cool to look at, right, is if you take, take a look at the front side of it, um, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Again, just go back a minute. Um, right. So again, this is a pretty recent uh, device that Apple's released. Um, and you can see it's using the, the Nordic, it's a Bluetooth device. So somewhat unsurprisingly in the Bluetooth world, we have the Nordic NRF um, device, you know, in this thing. So this was an interesting choice because prior to the release of this device, um, there was a presentation by limited results showing uh, attack on this. So it was fairly well known that you could actually have um, fairly, you know, easy access to this type of device. Um, and that's the sort of thing, so this is one that I kind of instrumented, right, um, that comes out with, with this sort of accessible um, tooling that, that is available in the industry. Um, and so this is something, right, where they, Apple probably knew about the threat model, or my assumption is they knew about the threat model, um, because it was a known problem um, at the release time. That, that NRF device um, was known to have this potential vulnerability when the, the you know, air tags were released, maybe it was already in design and they didn't care, but that has to be part of a threat model, right? That has to be something that you're considering when you're looking at these types of devices. Um, as another example of sort of a, a recent device, I got my hands on, and I don't have as much about this, um, but this is the, the Starlink dish. So um, it's huge, right? This isn't some weird forced perspective. I can show you that I'm actually holding it beside me. Um, so it's this huge device, right? Um, what the, the, the sort of interesting part of it is, of course, the, the embedded side. So if I go back over here again, um, what do you have? So I have some, I, I pretty recently did a teardown of this. Um, and there's been a great blog post. So Leonard... Um, Lemon Reuters, who has done a lot of Tesla work, actually had looked at this first and we were talking, I, I managed to get my hands on one as well. Um, so he had already identified that, you know, you basically have this uh, embedded Linux computer, right, with just like test points and stuff like that. So it actually didn't take a lot of, of hardware to um, at least be able to dump the EMMC. Um, this particular, you know, attack was talked about at Black Hat um, with like, there's a talk in, on, because I don't have slides, I don't have all the links in it, so I could set them up afterwards. But it was like, you know, $10 hardware hacking with an SD card reader, something like that. Um, so this was a Black Hat talk that went through all of the details of how you actually dump these devices. Um, and that was basically it. So there was some additional trickery that uh, Leonard goes over, but this is the sort of, you know, really low cost um, accessible tool tooling that makes it pretty interesting to me. Um, there's more work that kind of will tie into to some of the, the glitching stuff on this to come. Um, but you can see, again, these are like brand new, um, the, the date code. So if we look um, somewhere here, I might go under the, the other microscope. Because um, if you look at this, just to show you how kind of fresh this is, uh, right here on the PCB, I'm sorry, it's sideways, but this things way too big. Um, you have 2114 right there. So 2114, 14th week um, of 2021. Uh, so, you know, the raw PCB was done in, that's like April or something like that, right? And I got this at the end of June. Um, so that's, you can't say that's not like a, a quite new product. Um, this is the second rev of it actually. So that's the kind of interesting thing to me is that in these threat models, we now have all sorts of new things that weren't there previously. Um, how do we do, so now that we, you know, say, okay, this is potentially a threat, um, where does the accessible hardware security come in? 
Um, and I took a look at two sides of the, uh, the hardware security. So starting with power analysis, um, where did those projects kind of start? Because a lot of people are familiar with Chip Whisper, which I started in 2012. Um, but as an example, for me learning side channel, there was what I'm sure a lot of people will know as the, the blue book or the side channel book or different names for it. Um, but this is basically a book on uh, side channel power analysis, right? This is kind of goes over the, a, a lot of the techniques. Like this is how I pre this book, I didn't know anything about it. Um, and so you can imagine the accessibility is not just open source, right? This isn't an open source software project, um, but it can have a huge impact on the industry. And to me, that's a big part of why I wanna concentrate on the accessibility of the knowledge, the accessibility of the tooling, um, which does not just mean open source or super cheap or anything like that. Um, it can be helpful. You know, there's a lot of um, different aspects at play here, but that's the sort of interesting thing. So if you look at, at these tools, um, right, Open SCA was actually part of that book release, so that's why I bring it up, or was related to that, um, with uh, MATLAB scripts that were, were running examples on the, um, the book. Um, around the same time, so David Oswald also had this giant project, um, so this was a project that was pretty similar to Chip Whisper, Rev Zero actually, um, used the same sort of board so it could do glitching and, and power analysis as well. Um, there's been a number of other side channel analysis sort of software tools. Uh, so, and again, you might not be familiar with all of these, but they, they do interplay really nicely. Um, so there's a project by Riskier that has information in Julia. So it has a number of different attacks. Um, there's a project side channel marbles. So both of these were around 2016 um, that has some higher performance attacks, including white box crypto attacks. Um, so I know he would actually often be at at Hardware I.O. Uh, physically to, to give some various hardware hacking attacks, but he's done a lot of great work in this project as well. Um, Lascar was started by um, some people with the Ledger uh, Research Group. So this is a, a quite high performance side channel um, tool. And, and the interesting thing, right, is that I highlight them not to say like, oh, there's 20 different things you can use. But for example, we use Lascar um, inside of Chip Whisper, even in our official uh, demos, because it does a really good job at some higher performance work. Um, that was never the point of our, our uh, project that was often more concentrated on education um, and sort of some flexible research angles to it. So there's, you know, more that to, to the accessibility as well than just having 20 different projects that, that everyone can use. Um, and another one, Scared, we also have used this, so it implements some different attacks. Um, uh, company eShard has released under open source some of their, their tooling as well. And this is using similar Python and Jupyter to Chip Whisper. Um, so it's also a really nice um, device to work with too. Um, that's just power analysis. So that's actually, you know, and I'm gonna erase this so it doesn't get too, too messy on the board here. Um, Cause otherwise it starts to get really crowded I find. There we go. Cool. Um, so glitchers, this is like another right, part of this is so Chip Whisper can do glitch stuff. I meant to draw the, these lines to the projects that are over here, but they're, I just deleted them. So, um, right. But if you look at glitching, which is uh, kind of all the rage now, right? That's a really interesting thing. Um, you can think back to like smart card and loopers. So people that are, are working on that um, often would, you know, use glitchers in a product. Mod chip, so anyone that's done, installed an Xbox mod chip has installed, a, you know, an automatic glitcher into their Xbox. Um, so it's pretty interesting to see this sort of progression of it. I didn't put dates in this one uh, because it got pretty crowded, but there's also more um, glitching projects too. Um, some of them, for example, aren't official projects, but the accessibility of the research, you know, I've kind of made it a de facto project. So Chris Gerlinski, um, I'm sure lots of people have either seen his glitch on the LPC series device. Um, so he gave this talk at Recon and that included some information to recreate it using um, a low cost IC. Um, and so we ended up recreating it as well with Chip Whisperer and it's a really great demo. And it's sort of all because Chris made this available uh, to everyone to, you know, to share this research. 
Um, there's several other interesting uh, projects too. So um, Glitchink, Sammy kind of, Camker had a version of this. Um, debug and dump. So Thomas Roth, uh, who's did the, the Apple AirTag stuff, he's actually made a really low cost using a uh, Raspberry uh, Pi Pico, I think, right? That's the official name. Um, a sort of board. So it's like a $4 board. And then he has some circuitry around it. Um, you know, and, and this is accessible not just because it's cheap. Again, cheapness alone doesn't mean accessible, but it's accessible because you can build it pretty easily yourself. When I did Chip Whisper, it needed like a pretty big FPGA and things like that. So this is a pretty cool uh, thing to see, right? Um, limited results. So I'm sure many people have seen this work. This is this NRF work I mentioned. Um, now also some Silicon Labs work. And again, using a glitcher of their own design as well as recently an EM glitcher. Um, so the accessibility does not just mean if you didn't publish a cool open source project, you didn't help create accessible research, right? So um, the fact that limited results had this pretty open of uh, you know, examples, re really detailed in how it works, had videos of it, has actually helped people recreate it. Um, so I also kind of want to point out that you know, it's not just about the specifics of a project or a, a research paper or something like that. Um, so that's kind of what I see as you know, an example of how we're getting there as an industry. Now, the one thing I want to look at next is, okay, so what did Chip Whisperer start with? So when I talk about these accessibility, you know, this changes over time. So I actually found um, a few things here. So this was two examples. Um, this was a box. This box is labeled Chip Whisperer Lite Old Rev Protos, right? So you can actually see the progression. Um, I don't have Rev prior to this, but you basically start with, you know, and, and one of the ideas of the original Chip Whisper was using TQFP, uh, which limited the FPGA choice so that you could in theory hand solder. So this one is like Rev one, I think it'll say somewhere. Uh, where's this, oh yeah, CD. So I don't know if it's gonna show up in the video exactly, um, but it's Rev one. So you can see lots of like, oops, fly wires all over the place serial lines, switching direction, stuff like that. Um, and it goes onward, right, to, to other versions. Um, so this one, I think this was hand soldered because it looks like pretty terrible soldering. Um, so you can sort of see, see the progression there. Um, but another thing, and this was kind of a cool thing that, that uh, Joe Grant, so a while back as part of, of releasing Chip Whisper, one of the questions around accessibility is how do you make sure things um, continue to stay available? So I had sort of experimented with this, and this is an ongoing experiment. And you know, can you make a company out of sort of open source-ish um, accessible hardware? And so sometimes you you want to have higher costs to be able to you know actually do do stuff with it. Um, so this was the first rev of like a, looking at making a more serious chip whisper. Um, and this box, there's a few of them out there still. Um, so this box was part of an EFF auction um, that Joe Grand actually won. So he, I got him to sign it to, when he sent it back. We swapped him for a newer chip whisper. Um, but you can see, right, like this is, the, these original ones um, were sort of a very early version of experimenting with different methods of, of designing some of this stuff, um, which is in a similar way. So the other demo, um, I've often done is around another tool, right? Chip Sharder, which is an EM fault injection tool. So um, there was a few good examples of this um, with uh, this open source uh, BadFET um, tool. So this open source BadFET tool uh, was a EM glitcher. And basically with EM glitching really quickly, so just to give you the, the background, I'm gonna put my spray. Okay, there we go. Um, all we're gonna do, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we're gonna have a coil of wire, basically, right? And you're gonna have a chip under it. And under that chip, right, this is connected to a board. Um, the idea is that you send a, a field through this chip, chip, right? And this magnetic field is gonna induce in structures on the chip 
right? So the chip has all sorts of structures. It's going to induce voltages in on that uh, chip as well. So um, that, in theory, is going to change voltages on nodes, which can give us uh, the effects of the glitching. The problem with this is to do this, the, the most common way is you have a capacitor here, right? And you want to switch that capacitor onto this coil. Um, so we want to switch that capacitor onto the coil. The, the problem is the safe way to do it would be to connect this to ground and then put your switch up here. So this is what we do in chip shooter. That turns out to be pretty complicated. So this is one of the things where there's the question of accessibility. So to do this ended up with a more expensive design that we had to get safety certified, you know, that was expensive, um, but it could exist, which is where I consider it more accessible. The other option, and this is what you can do in a lot of open source tools, so you can kind of have both coexisting safely, um, is if you put your switch in the bottom side, right? This is actually electrically pretty straightforward. Um, because your switching voltage is now referenced to ground. Up here, the switching voltage was referenced to some higher voltage. Um, so this is actually much nicer to design, much cheaper. You can really easily make these types of glitches. Um, the downside, so this is where the issue is, is that right? if this is at 500 volts and this switch is open, then your coil over here is at 500 volts uh, all the time. So that's kind of the, the, the quick note on the difference here. Um, and the coil, what this looks like um, is you basically, I don't know if this will be too close. Um, you have kind of a coil, let me try this, of wire with a ferrite. Um, and this coil of wire here is, there you go. So you can see this coil, right? So this is like a four millimeter um, ferrite. So not, you know, not super tiny, not that complicated to build. Um, and that's pretty interesting because you can go ahead and glitch stuff right like through the case. So the demo I'm often doing is uh, because it, it makes it really obvious to show is this Trezor Bitcoin wallet. So we'll plug that in. Um, and what you can see here, right, is I might have already broken it. Unknown bootloader. So it shouldn't be saying that but I was using this for another demo, um, but you basically can glitch it through the enclosure. So the interesting thing is you might see it go, go into weird states. So there you can see stack smashing detected. Um, so there is some different, so I'd give a, a talk about glitching this over USB. Um, it turns out you can glitch some of the, um, the different types of um, read protection on the microcontroller itself. So that's what's pretty interesting. Um, the other thing around accessibility is that, I've, I've also started to ask a question. I asked this last year, but it kind of got distracted in the pandemic. You know, could you glitch with old technology? So this was a fun project I built um, that basically uses like all discrete logic uh, with a multiplexer to actually do voltage glitching. So um, it's something that I've, I've pushed out a little bit, but it's, it's kind of a fun project. So if anyone is interested, let me know. Um, and you basically have like a simple example board that you can, can glitch to show this. So. Um, that was sort of some of the, you know, the interesting things I see is that the accessibility of these tools has made the attacks, you know, a lot more common. Um, but it also means that the attacks, um, there, there, there's more tools that come out of it. It kind of feeds itself, which is what I think is, is pretty cool. Um, so a lot of the, the future of this that we're going to be working on is we do have updated hardware in progress. So if you're on the Chip Whisper, um, Git, you might notice some, some tools. Chip Whisper Husky um, is a newer capture board in Bergen, but I don't have those with me, so I can't, uh, can't show that fully. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, though, is this defensive projects. And this is, I think, a, an interesting, um, interesting thing that is going to be you know, pretty useful for a lot of people as they're building their expertise. Um, and these defensive projects are actually now doing like open source sort of root of trust type devices. So, this really started, there was a project Cryptech Alpha. Um, and so this Cryptech group actually built a FPGA design. Um, and so this was around 2015. I'm, I'm just going by memory here, um, ish, sometime in there. And so there's open source cores for AES, ECC, stuff like that. So if you're working on 
um, hardware security, this is a really good resource for you to understand what's you know, coming down the pipe, so to speak. Um, another project, so this one didn't become quite as popular as I thought it might be. Another project you might've heard of is Open Titan. Um, so this is something that will probably also be of a lot of interest because this is hopefully going to end up becoming an ASIC. Um, so this is an open source root of trust uh, based on a RISC-V processor, right? Um, with hardened AES ECC core stuff like that. And it's all open, so you can actually go ahead and look at it right now. Um, there's other projects that have also recently started. So um, one that is probably also relatively mature is part of the Be Trusted, um, I think that IO. Um, so this was part of Bunny's project, as part of a larger system, right, of, of designing how do you trust a device, a cell phone, a laptop, something like that. Um, so that was part of his overall goal. So there's actually an open source root of trust there. Um, the other one I'll mention that I don't know if there's code yet is Tropic, I think it's called Tropic Square. Um, and so this was some of the uh, Trezor wallet guys looking at an open source root of trust. But, but this is cool because to me, this is like the beginning of that phase of, you know, there's a few projects. Um, in some cases, they're getting quite popular, like the Open Titan um, and Be Trusted projects. But we're starting to see what I see as the, the sort of next gen of actual um, work on open source and accessible, not just fully open source, but accessible hardware security, you know, uh, defense. And this is really cool because it means, you know, you might be able to use this in your designs, but from a research perspective, it's hopefully going to push forward a lot of the, the work we're doing. Um, so yeah, I think that was you know, the main thing, and I promised dogs, so I got to find them still. Um, the main thing, right, was that I really want to push that there's a lot of this accessibility is, is becoming um, something that's really important. And accessibility doesn't just mean open source, right? It can be the blog posts. It can be going to the, the conference presentations, um, giving presentations, giving workshops, right? Uh, I, I don't want people to come away and say the only way to, to do this is to have an open source uh, design. So, okay, here's one. Luna, come on. Sorry, if I'm yelling in your ear my dog's name potentially, but here we can switch cameras and then I can uh, bring her over. Let's try this. Oh, there you go. You can see her. All right. Friends, that's the keynote speaker of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so if you have any questions, I think we have a, um, oh, there's the other one. Uh, we have a breakout room I can go to. Okay. And there's dog two. Here you go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks very much for attending. Um, attending Hardware IO, of course, is the always a great part to a part place to be a part of. Um, and yeah, I think Andrew, I'll hand back to you for, for the next. All right. Uh, thank you, Colin, uh, for sharing. Uh, I don't know how many years of experience uh, with all of us. There are a few questions. Uh, there's one question uh, from Riddhi. If someone wants to start learning hardware security, what's the first hands on experience you would recommend? Um, so a lot of it's just finding something interesting, right? So I guess I should say buy my book right now. That should be the, the prime. But no, the, the real thing is find something interesting and just take a look at it. So this was um, in, let's use uh, this camera maybe. So in we're just moving um, offices. And in the building I was at, it came with some readers, some like card readers, right? So, and then I was able to find extra ones. But it was cool because it was like a system that I had. Um, and so I, I just kind of took it apart. You find some test points, you can, you know, hack on it, so to speak, um, is I think one of the best things. Uh, it's hard to know ahead of time what's a good target. Um, if you can find some cheaper stuff is, is, is often interesting, um, but it's pretty interesting to look at something that other people haven't. So the, these particular ones, there wasn't a lot of um, previous work on. And, you know, that, that made it kind of interesting. Anything new like the air tags or the Starlink stuff is pretty cool. Um, the air tag ones are not a bad example because there's some good uh, videos. So like Thomas Roth made this really detailed video of it um, and shows how to actually, 
you know, recreate this type of attack. So um, it's one of those things where kind of jumping in could work really well. Uh, you might have a few false starts. So the other thing I'd say is if you do this, if you just jump in on a random device to be like, I'm interested in how this works, how security works on it, uh, it might be really bad. There's lots of devices I look at where it's a hassle, to be honest. So I don't go through and fully analyze it because it's like, ah, it's, you know, it's a device that no one knows how to unlock and there's no test points. So you're going to have to spend a lot of time. And if you can kind of go through a few different devices, you might find something that makes it a lot more interesting to get started with. All right, uh, Colin, there's another question that's come to me in private. Uh, it's also quite, uh, I think for somebody who's just a beginner getting into hardware security, what are the recommended tools uh, that one should have uh, to start getting into the basics of IoT security hacking? So basically I think the question is what tools uh, should he have in the lab? Mm. And, and this is a good question. Um, it depends a little bit on what you're doing, which is a bad answer. Uh, but it's also, you don't have to run out and spend a, a ton of money is I think the important thing. So uh, this was a cool, so Thomas Roth, this debug and, and dump tool he was making, uh, used a Raspberry Pi Pico um, to give you like USB UART and SPY and some other stuff. Um, Joe Fitzpatrick has this like FTDI tool that can talk to a lot of different interfaces. Uh, normally, I, th I think the basics for anyone is always going to be, you end up needing an oscilloscope. So that can be one of the more expensive ones. I know like back when I was just getting started in electronics, it's something I've tried to avoid buying for a while because it's expensive. Um, but to see, you know, what's happening at the hardware level is, is pretty key. And it's also nice because there's now a big range of it. Um, there's really low cost ones, there's you know, higher cost ones and stuff like that. Um, once you have an oscilloscope, you end up with wanting some digital logic. Um, so Salier logic analyzers are really good. I, I like them a lot. I use them quite a bit. Um, and from there, you'll end up needing at least some sort of like SPI or UART interface. Um, the common one is FTDI based and it works pretty well, to be honest. So um, Joe Fitzpatrick's tool I like, but there's a few others there too. Um, yeah, but beyond that, there is some good lists online. So uh, we're putting together actually for this, this book, we're putting together a GitHub and, and have quite a few tools we're going to list there. Um, there are a few other Git uh, projects I've come across. Um, Mark Large Cardinal on Twitter uh, he has some good lists as well, and you know they'll link to other ones. There is one more question. Uh, in EM fault injection attack, what, according to you, is better pulse pattern for glitching most of devices? Do we need multiple pulse, or one pulse per cycle is good enough? Um, uh, good question. So the weird thing with glitching is it, it can be hard to answer because you kind of get an end effect, and you don't know always what caused it. So I've looked at glitching where I do use multiple, um, you know, in a row and it needs to be multiple, but in the end I find out, you know, a single pulse of a lower amplitude actually worked pretty well. So it seems like the multiple in a row were just averaging. Um, a lot of what I end up doing is just one pulse. Um, most of the targets I'm looking at, the caveat there is most of the targets I'm looking at aren't protected against this. So if you start getting into protected targets, you also really can get to the point where it's, you know, not just you need multiple pulses to skip something, but you want to, um, you know, cause two checks to fail or two checks to be skipped. Um, so yeah, it's a hard question to answer. You can get away with one. So if it's a question of tool capability, you know, and all you have is a tool that can do a single pulse because, you know, self-building something or whatever, um, I wouldn't discount it as a very valid use case of just a single pulse. Um, you know, if, if you can do multiple, there are some use cases where that's really handy, uh, but I wouldn't say it's a necessary. Yeah. Any other questions or? Okay. Sorry, I was saying and I didn't realize I was on mute. Oh, uh, no, okay. question, uh, how do you start, how do you get started in medical device testing? 
Uh, good question. So uh, the, I, I don't have a great answer to that. Um, I know there's other people have done more with medical. I actually uh, ended up not really talking about it. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was some interesting thing. This is like an, a side story around medical and a hint at what good devices are to look at. Um, so the ResMed um, CPAP machines, they um, break this down. So you have the reference. So ResMed. Um, so they have these like CPAP BiPAP, right? So you have CPAP, you have BiPAP. And there was concern if we couldn't get enough ventilators at the time, right? It's funny thinking back to pandemic beginning uh, when it was like, wash your hands, like breathe heavily on each other, that's fine. But if you wash your hands, it's, uh, it's good. Um, and so right at the time, the, the question was, could we use the BiPAPs as a replacement for ventilators? Um, because they had poor, they were like a potentially a poor man's ventilator because um, they use two pressures to help you breathe. Uh, CPAP is just constant pressure, not you definitely not useful. Um, so ResMed makes both of these machines. The cost difference is substantial between both of these machines. Both of these machines physically look exactly the same, um, entirely the same. If you take them apart, they look the same, very suspicious. Um, these machines use an STM, and in fact, they don't even have protection on it. So they have a STM32 inside it. Um, and it kind of turned out that the difference between a CPAP and a BiPAP, which is different billing prices, different everything, is in fact the firmware running on the STM32. Um, so it's a pretty interesting device to look at. There's actually now some people that have been trying to make like open source firmware to run on them and stuff like that. Um, so they're a pretty fun thing. Uh, it kind of, it turned out that it wasn't really necessary in the end. And there's a lot of questions about this company and the billions of dollars they have, and are they going to sue you? Um, that made it less interesting to, to go further on. But there's a few of these ventilators that actually use a pretty similar design, or not ventilators, um, the CPAPs, use a pretty similar design and can be a, an interesting place to get started. Besides that, it's a lot of like what you can find, right? So if you look at a lot of people that have done medical research, it's often because they had like an insulin pump or something. Um, so if you're able to find the devices on eBay, also could be a pretty cool way to get started. All right, uh, Colin, there's one more technical question, but I would recommend Sanjay to take it up with you in the breakout room. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much, Colin, uh, for sharing and uh, being our keynote speaker. Friends, this is the book uh, Colin and Jasper has written together. Uh, go out there, pre-order it from No Starch Press. Uh, you guys can get into hardware hacking by at least references from the books and some interesting stories mentioned <laughs> over here. Well, thanks uh, so much again for having me. Enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colin. Bye.